to indulge ourselves with what-if questions, hypotheticals. What if I had tried the meat instead of the fish for dinner? What if I had just added X, Y, or Z to that exam paper I sat yesterday? Or even, what if I had tried a little harder in my violin lessons when I was younger? Would I have become the next Nicola Benedetti? The answer to that, to that one is no, definitely not. My mum's laughing. <laughs> well, what if I told you that my what if question may have resulted in a completely different cultural, architectural, and political makeup of continental Europe? Because my what if question features around a series of events spanning the 16th and 17th centuries, which together determined the future of Europe. But before we dive right into this question, I think it's first important to establish what exactly counterfactual history is. It's not hard. It simply looks at what things might have been. As Rutger Bregman, popular Dutch historian, says, the past teaches us a simple but crucial lesson. Things might have been different. Our current status quo could easily have been the result of the trivial yet critical twists and turns of history. So what have exactly been the trivial yet critical twists and turns of East meets West history? Well, to answer this question, I think we can draw upon the long-established history of both tangible military confrontation and ideolo ideological interaction between the Christian and Eastern worlds. Behind me, you can see a quick chronology of East to West relations, starting in 702 and ending on the 12th of September, 1683, the all-important Ottoman defeat at the Battle of Vienna. Whilst pre-1683, the Ottomans were making substantial inroads into Europe, their decisive loss at the Battle of Vienna ensured the farthest the Ottomans, the Islamic forces ever got to conquering Europe were indeed the gates of Vienna. And since this ticks all the criteria of being a true historical turning point, it's this event which is going to form the basis of our talk here today. So what are the implications? I think these can be categorized into political and legal, geographical and architectural, and religious and cultural. But I'll start with the religious and cultural. We often think of Istanbul as the buffer between East and West. But what if this wasn't the point at which East met West? What if East was West and West was East? When theorizing on an Islamic Europe, it's important to not just look at the fundamentals of Christian and Islamic doctrine and practice, but also appreciate how religion plays an important role in molding society and developing culture. And Islamic Europe would not just adhere to an entirely different set of canonical texts, but its, its demography, its society, its linguistics would be vastly different as well. For example, there are a number of European nations who throughout their history have been met by an Islamic power and who share some degree of overlap with the Arabic uh, linguistics and lexicon. For example, Bosnian, Catalan, Croatian, Hungarian, Portuguese all use Arabic loanwords. Maltese is actually derived from the Arabic itself. So it's interesting to note whether or not an Islamic Europe would have shared a greater degree of linguistic uniformity and how would this shape the way in which nations interact and, and perhaps do diplomacy with their neighbors. You may ask why geography? Surely if the Ottomans have marched their way across Europe, then the Danube would still flow into the Black Sea, Mont Blanc would still tower over the Alps, and, and the Dalmatian coast would still glisten gloriously in the creation sun. But as you will see, geography is so much more than some mountains here, a river there, and a coast or two along the bottom here. When comparing the geographies of the Christian and Islamic worlds, what's most visibly different is their architecture. Besides the replacement of, say, St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican with the Blue Mosque in Jerusalem, an Islamic Europe would change the very fabric of the European-built environment. And when looking at, say, the different human and physical geographies of Rome and Vienna with Beirut and Damascus, what's really interesting is to see how 
Society at any one moment in time is captured and mirrored by the architecture and the built environment. Had the Ottomans successfully imposed Islam over Europe, then European landscape might have been completely framed by multifoil arches, onion domes, Islamic geometric motifs, and so on. Until the Age of Enlightenment, sort of Christian thought guided most of European language, science, philosophy. And indeed, the very notion of Europe and the Western world has been intimately connected with, with Christianity and Christendom. Clearly, religion, whether it be Christianity or Islam, is a key political and legal issue too. So when juxtaposing a hypothetical Islamic Europe with the more Christian one we have, I think it's important to look at the differences between the Western and Eastern political institution and penal codes. For example, let's juxtapose the Western political system of the European Union or the Western penal system of British common law with, say, an Islamic theocracy, liberal democracy, or monarchy, or even penal codes such as Sharia law. How would this have changed, fundamentally changed, European identity? But in order to demonstrate all of this a little better, I think it's prudent to dedicate some time looking at a specific case study. And I've chosen Budapest, capital of Hungary, since I think in terms of cultural and political and architectural richness, um, it's the closest we can get to really feeling and seeing how an Islamic Europe would have looked like. And behind me, you can actually see two maps, one locating Budapest within the context of Hungary and the other one uh, detailing the layout of the city itself. And what's most important to note here is that Budapest itself is actually split into two halves. The more hilly Buddha side with its overt Moorish architecture and then the low-lying Pesht side with its more Christian foundations. And to really see the unique interplay of Christian and Islamic forces, which is coalesced in this one city, I'm going to unpack some of its most iconic tourist destinations. So firstly, the evidently Christian St. Stephen's Basilica. It's a Catholic basilica built in neoclassical style and located in the heart of Budapest. Here we have Dohani Street Synagogue, largest synagogue in Europe, second largest in the world. Look very closely and you can see that this synagogue actually has two minarets. If you're wondering why a synagogue has two slender towers usually associated with the Muslim call to prayer, excellent question. It's because in a past lifetime, this synagogue was actually a mosque. And here, the Museum of Applied Arts. Built in Art Nouveau style, its interior contains Hindu, Mughal, and Islamic elements as well. And if you look at the beautiful ceramic tiles, you can see that they're very symmetrical, and this is reminiscent of Islamic art and architecture. And finally, Fisherman's Bastion, located in the Buddha Castle, built in neo-Gothic style and, and clearly inspired by Moorish architecture. So we can see the Islamic effects on the built environment are very prevalent. But what's even more interesting to see is that Hungary itself is currently witnessing a worrying resurgence in profoundly anti-Muslim sentiment. The Prime Minister Viktor Orban and his reactionary Fidesz party have pushed anti-Muslim anti populism from the margins of the political sphere and into the mainstream. And this can be witnessed from his description of um, Syrian and Iraqi refugees coming into Europe to seek a home as nothing more than quote-unquote Muslim invaders trying to undermine the Christian identity of Europe. And I think it's fairly clear to see that this rhetoric is peddling a false narrative, attempting to rewrite centuries worth of Hungarian, but not just Hungarian, European multicultural history. And I think it's our duty today to dispel, his, uh, to dispel some of these myths surrounding uh, national identity using history. So when reflecting on the past, I think it's often true that we characterize Christian and Islamic interaction as a destructive confrontation rather than a constructive interaction. And I think that this is wrong in parts because there exists, as I hope you've seen today, a significant uh, degree of overlap between the two worlds. And, and actually, they can sometimes complement each other quite beautifully, as we've seen in Budapest. And perhaps we could even take a 
a moment to thank the Islamic world for all it has bestowed upon us Westerners. You know, surgery, calligraphy, even toothbrushes were all born out of the Islamic golden age. So apart from the fact that this is an interesting question, why is it an important question to ask? Why isn't this just another example of some overly keen student fleshing out their slightly underbaked armchair theories? Well, in response to my very pointed question, I think the what-ifs of history help elucidate the past, present, and future and demonstrate that history, politics, culture are all fluid and dynamic rather than static. Moreover, when looking at George W. Bush's 2003 war on terror and the ill-fated invasion of Iraq and unfortunately now it seems Afghanistan, it's key to see that these historical questions, these geographical questions, these political questions are fundamental foreign policy issues which have corporeal effects for us at home in the West. And two years ago, The Guardian did a poll. Two thirds of Britain see a fundamental clash in Christianity and Islam. Yet, isn't it fascinating to consider how this fundamental clash may have been completely reversed? Change the outcome of one event, say, the Battle of Vienna, and you alter the course of history entirely. Thank you.